we appear to be live on Facebook. Um, the online Gurdjieff group. This is Sunday, April the 12th, 2020. Um, it just seems right now, so far it's myself and Brian. Um, so Brian, how are things where you are? We just spoke for a couple of minutes before I went on Facebook, but uh, um, how are things in Phoenix with the whole COVID-19? And I guess you're working, but uh, is it fun to drive around? Are there minimal cars on the road? Is it all quiet? People are keeping away from each other? It's, I mean, it's definitely nice having less traffic on the roads, but um, I mean, last week, it seems like things are getting a little bit weird. Um, I was very, um, I was surprised when I went to the grocery store and there was only, there was a 50 person limit on how many people could go in. And that was new. And that, you know, that's a little bit weird. Um, I thought it was a little bit excessive. Like, you know, you can still keep your distance to less than 50 people in a huge grocery store. Um, and I'm just, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm starting to worry a little bit more, not as much about the virus, but just about like almost like government overreach, you know, and people taking it to a point where it's going to cause other problems. I also saw um, something where in Florida, the farmers are just having to raise their crops, like they're not being able to sell them because of it, um, the restaurants are closed. And so they're just wasting tons and tons of food that eventually like down the road, that's going to come back. You know, that food, like if there's a food shortage or if there's, um, you know, the rise in prices of food, all that stuff is yet to come. But I'm, you know, it's, I assume it's going to be a ripple effect where we're going to feel this for a long time. And when you start seeing grocery stores with limits um, and issues with the farmers, you know, that's something that a lot of people aren't really talking about yet, but it's going to be a thing. What about uh, in terms of yourself? Yeah. Um, do you notice perhaps that uh, you can do inner work a little more cleanly? Uh, do you notice an effect on your ability to do any kind of inner practices? Uh, is this pulling you away? Is this distracting you? Are you hunting down articles online and filling your head brain with stuff? Or are you able to go more inwards? Um, when it comes to the work, I mean, I, it makes me more grateful for the work because I see people around me kind of like, you know, starting to crack a little bit and it's really getting to them. It doesn't get to me like that. I'm just trying to stay aware of, you know, what's going on and potential problems down the road. But I've actually, no, I mean, I've been okay. I've really, work has been slowed down and I've really enjoyed the time that I've had. When, when you mean by, uh, you just froze in there. When you mean by slow down, um, is, can you give a percentage figure? I don't know if you're, you're still look like you're frozen. Percent. Uh, a percentage of slow down. I mean, how much work about, is, whoops. I'm down about 50%, 40 okay. to 50%. Yeah. I mean, I'm down 100%. I'm one of the businesses because I meet people face to face, um, mm -hmm. like hairdressers and massage therapists and whatever. I'm completely shut down. Um, yeah. So it's really strange for me not to, you know, I don't have phone calls. I don't have emails. No one's asking about my services. No one's attempting to contact me or whatever. Um, but what I found is my own ability to do inner work has increased uh, because I have less distractions, um, mm -hmm. less things pulling at me, so to speak. So I've had a, a, a greater sense um, to self-remember, to be present, to be here in this moment as fully as I can. And it's, you know, it's like, I, 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 I'm pretty good at it, but it's like, it's, it's gone up even more. Um, and part of it, I think, is just the enforced isolation. Um, I mean, I was hoping, you know, perhaps Ian would have been able to join us today. Um, 
because he's done uh, a number of, uh, back in the past, you know, 30, 60 day meditation retreats. And I was, you know, wondering how this would compare to a meditation retreat. Um, ultimately, the things within us that are stirred up by the outside world, by what is going on, by connections, by people, by whatever, begin to settle down. Those reverberations, those vibrations calm down. And it gives us an opportunity to go more inwards and to do more inner work. Um, yeah. What well, what's the the, the 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 state of your inner work right now? Where are you at, Brian? Um, well, I've been able to do the um, those morning uh, the morning sittings that you had posted online. Um, I'm able to do those without any guidance now. You know, I would use those to help me along, but now I can do them no problem, just all by myself. So I figure that's a pretty uh, pretty good step. Uh, it is when it, to, when it comes to those inner exercises yeah. you know um usually i would just need those to kind of um to get me started and then just work me through them so the mind doesn't wander but um i being able to do it by myself it also helps um kind of come back to the present moment throughout the day um you know because i think it's a little bit more effort to um do it without the recording yeah. Uh, doing it without the recording, have you been able to um, increase the speed slightly or does it still take the same length of time? I, I know that when I do that without the recording, you know, I just I can go right down my arm and back up again much quicker than I narrate it. And so the developing the sensation of myself and to go through the various things uh, using words and following words and spoken words, you know, is a, a, a bit slower when I do it on my own excuse me I'm able to do it much quicker um, have you noticed that not much quicker but quicker um, I actually do like a little bit of both I mean sometimes I can go through a little bit quicker but other times like especially now again since things are kind of slow I really take my time with it and I'll just go slower um, you know especially you know when you're going up and down the limbs instead of just going moving from one part of the limb to the next quickly I'll like place the attention on one part of them and kind of sit there for a little bit and then move to the next part. Um, have you noticed anything else? Any, I mean, are your emotions more settled? Um, I guess you're able to handle what's going on with uh, COVID-19 better than you would otherwise. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, it just, I feel like the whole COVID-19 thing, it, it provides um, you know, new opportunities. Yeah. Um, and I'm just looking for, um, you know, ways to fill my time, uh, been, been able to catch up on reading, been able to catch up on some art projects, um, and, uh, you know, just enjoying the downtime. I mean, I feel like it has made me uh, more aware and more present. And also more aware of a lot of other things that we wouldn't have been aware of society, economics, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, more, and, just, and actually just more grateful in general. You know, when you see lines getting into the grocery store, you know, when you leave there with your food or when you make the food later that day, you know, there's definitely some gratitude, some uh, additional gratitude there when you're eating it. Okay, um, I'm just going to bring up the vow. I work for myself. I work for mankind. I work for the earth herself. I wish to be, I can be, I have the ability, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be. I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be to help others. This is to be understood as a vow. Mr. Gurdjieff often uh, talked about, and he never enumerated them, but uh, he, where, how do I stop sharing? Whoops. I'm, am I even sharing this? <laughs> 
I might not have even been sharing that. Um, whoops, I'm not even sharing that. So let's quickly share that. I wish to be, I can be, I have the right to be, I have the ability to be. I swear to myself that this will never be for my personal profit, but to help others. I wish to be, to help others. This is to be understood as a vow. And Mr. Gurdjieff, uh, to a number of the students, talked about the 15 commandments of God, and he never enumerated them, but, you know, tying into that uh, affirmation there, that vow, you know, he said one of the commandments of God is that one hand cannot wash itself. It requires two hands. And by this he meant that we are not individual completely individual we're not isolated we're not cut off from other people one hand washes the other so this work we work with each other we work for each other we work to help each other we work to help ourselves so let's just become aware of our body try to become aware of your body as fully as you can just in this moment do your best to sense your body to become aware of the fact that you are an embodied being and then let's do a little bit of relaxation and relaxation during the waking state and when we do inner work should come from the head down to the bottom of the feet. So just bring your attention to the very top of your head and imagine relaxing the crown of your head and then moving down and relaxing the frontalis muscles, the forehead muscles, relaxing your eyebrows, relaxing your eyes, Relaxing the muscle deep in the center of your nose, your nasalis muscle. Relaxing the tiny uh, nostril crinkler muscles that flow down either side of your nose and allow you to crinkle your nose. Relaxing the tiny nostril dilator muscles. Relaxing the two muscles between the bottom of your nose and your upper lip, especially the second deeper one that flattens against your teeth as it relaxes. Relaxing the circular lip muscle, top, sides, bottom. Relaxing the triangular muscles underneath the corners of each lip that allow you to pull your lips down. Relaxing the various muscles underneath your lower lip. Relaxing the muscles in your chin, including your mentalis muscle. And then returning to your eyes and relaxing the muscle that's connected to the top of your eyes that flows up over your eyes into the eye socket where it connects to the bone at the back. And then relaxing the muscles connected to the bottom of your eyes and relaxing them as they flow underneath your eyeballs into your eye socket and connect to the bone at the back. And then relaxing the muscles on the right and left sides of your eyes that flow around your eyes, into your eye socket, connecting to the bone at the back. Relaxing your eyelid lifter muscle. And then moving down and relaxing the muscles in your cheeks. There are two muscles that flow from your cheeks down to your lips, one to the corner of your lips, and one flows down to approximately where your canine teeth are. And then relaxing the various muscles in your lips. There's a muscle in the lips called the trumpeter muscle that people who play trumpets exercise. And then relaxing the masseter muscle. It's the main muscle that flows from your temple bone down to your jaw bone. And then we've got two muscles called sphenoid muscles. Sphenoid means butterfly. The eye sockets, the bone in the eye sockets look like butterflies if you looked at the bone of the eye sockets. And the sphenoid bones connect to the bone right on the outside of the eye and they connect to the temple bone. 
So they've got two points of connections. One comes down to the jaw and the other comes down to the bend in the jaw. Now the masseter muscle, the main chewing muscle, it moves our jaw up and down, but the sphenoid bones or muscles allow us to move our jaw from side to side. So try to distinguish those muscles to relax them. And then try to relax the various muscles in the temple bone, the, the small muscles behind the ears, the occipital muscle at the very back of the head, and the occipital muscle is connected with tendons. And so whenever we move our scalp and our forehead, it's actually coming from behind our head. And then let's just move down and relax the various muscles in our throat and neck. Try to come out to the, there's big wide muscles that come up about half an inch onto our jaw and then flow down to our collarbone. These big wide muscles at the very front. And then there are, within our throat, there are some deeper, smaller muscles. There are muscles that are associated with the swallowing within our mouth. And then move into the tiny neck muscles in the back, close to your spine. And then some of the larger muscles. There's a very important muscle that's connected right behind the ear and then flows down to the front. These, this muscle helps us turn our head. And then we've got other muscles that flow from the base of our spine down to our shoulders and from the base of our, our skull, base of our spine, base of our skull down to our shoulders and the base of our skull down to our shoulder blades. These are some very important muscles to relax. We often keep a lot of tension in our neck, in our shoulders. And then relax your shoulders. And then move down into your upper arms, biceps, by two, two main muscles in the upper arm. Then move down into your lower arm. And there are approximately 25 muscles in the lower arms. There's an outer circle of muscles, an inner circle of muscles, and there are two bones. And there's actually muscles between the bones. And as you relax your lower arms, you should notice an effect of relaxing your wrist, relaxing your hands, because a lot of these movements are actually controlled by the muscles in the lower arms. And then relax your hands themselves. Relax the muscles in the top of your hands, the palms of your hands. Relax the muscles in your fingers. And then move up to your chest and try to become aware of your pectoral major and minor muscles and relax those muscles. And then try to move a little bit inwards and relax the intercostal muscles between your ribs. And then try to move even further inwards and relax that majestic muscle in the center of your chest, your heart. Try to relax it. Try to become aware of your heart. Try to slow it down. And then move down a little bit into your solar plexus, relaxing those muscles, relaxing your abdominal muscles, down into your abdomen, relaxing your abdomen. We've got these large, wide, flat muscles that are go down either side of our abdomen on the surface. Try to relax those muscles. Try to relax your abdomen and all of the muscles in your abdomen. And then move down into your pelvic region and try to relax your pelvic muscles. And then move to your upper back, shoulder blades. Relax those muscles. Relax the muscles in your middle back. Now we have a spine, and then we have two large muscles midway in our back, not beside the spine, but further out that flow from our shoulder blades down. We've also got our spine and we've got main muscles that run down either side of the spine. 
Try to relax all of those muscles. Try to relax the muscles deep in your lower back. And then move down into your hips, relaxing your buttocks, relaxing your upper legs, your hamstrings in the back, your thighs on the top. Moving down and relaxing your shins and your calves, your ankles. Relaxing your feet, the top of your feet, your toes and heels, the bottom of your feet. Just try to relax all of the muscles in your body. And then as you breathe in, breathe in to the top of your head. And when you breathe out, relax your body all the way down to the bottom of your feet. Breathing in to the top of your head and then relaxing your body again all the way down to the bottom of your feet. Breathing in to the top of your head and sending a warm wave of relaxation down your body to the bottom of your feet. Just relaxing your body as deeply as you can. And try to do a mental inventory. Use the power of your attention to pay attention inwardly to the various muscles in your body and try to notice if you're still holding onto some sort of tension within your body. Perhaps I can notice a little bit of tension right above my eyebrows in this moment to consciously Go back and find those points where you're slightly more tense than other places in the body and just breathe relaxation into them. Learning how to relax is actually the prerequisite for inner work. It was something that Mr. Gurdjieff stressed over and over and over. First, learn to relax. A lot of his exercises, he said, do not even begin them until you spend 15 minutes relaxing your body, putting yourself into a collected state, calming yourself down. And only once you have calmed yourself do you begin your inner work. So again, bring your awareness to the top of your head and as you breathe out, relax your whole body down to the bottom of your feet. Now, today, April 12th, 2020, according to the Gregorian calendar, it's Easter, Easter Sunday. And we're still trying to maintain this awareness of your body. I'm going to uh, share my screen. And I don't often like to talk about Beelzebub tales. You will never get a second opportunity to receive a first impression. And so much of this book is about receiving first impressions. But I'm going to share a page, approximately a page in the book. And this is from the Holy Planet Purgatory. So just try, as I read this, to maintain this awareness of your body, perhaps become aware of your breath aware of the sensation of air as it flows in from your nose to your lungs and back out again, perhaps becoming aware of the movement of the various muscles involved in breathing, aware of your body breathing, aware of your body as one organic whole. And this is about prayer. At this place of my explanations concerning chiefly the fundamental laws of world creation and world maintenance. It is, necess it is interesting to notice, by the way, that the three brain beings of this planet, which has taken your fancy, already began 
at the period when the consequences of the properties of the organ Kunda buffer were not yet crystallized in their common presence to be aware of these three holy forces of the sacred Triya, Triya Mazikamno, and then named them first God the Father, second God the Son, and third God the Holy Ghost. Notice this, first, second, third. We can actually say God the Father is hydrogen one. God the Son is hydrogen three. God the Holy Ghost is hydrogen six. And in various cases, express the hidden meaning of them and also their longing to have a beneficent effect from them for their own individuality by the following prayers. Sources of divine rejoicings, revolts and sufferings. Direct your actions upon us. Or holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Transubstantiate in me for my being. Or, holy God, holy firm, holy immortal, have mercy on us. And just going back to this first, second, third, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. The order then gets mixed up. It's actually put into its proper order in terms of a prayer. So sources of divine Rejoicing, rejoicings is the affirming. Revolts is the denying. Sufferings is the reconciling. Here, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Holy God, holy firm, holy immortal. So these prayers, the three that he gives here, are slightly different order then God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. These have been put into where the, high, the, um, the higher blends with the lower, so the holy affirming blends with the holy denying to meet in the middle as the holy reconciling. So the holy reconciling as hydrogen three is really above the holy denying in the ray of creation. Just as Holy immortal is above holy firm. So just with the idea, the only place that he really gave prayers were on page 752 of the Elzebub Tales to his grandson in the chapter of the holy planet Purgatory. So just bring yourself back to your body. Bring yourself back to your physical awareness. And I'm going to play three short recordings I made just uh, not quite two years ago uh, involving these prayers. And these three uh, techniques, inner exercises, uh, come from Paul Beidler. And the first one is the 60 bone exercise. There are actually three bones in your thumb, the top, the middle, and then the one that moves into the bone in your thumb. So there are 15 bones in your hands or your hand, 30 in both hands, 60 if we include the bones in our feet. So it's called the 60 bone exercise. And it's based on the prayer, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling transubstantiate for me transubstantiate within me for my being and then we'll loop into another one that uh moves up the various joints in the body up the spine and um another one that moves through the joints in the body but i've got explanations for all of them uh on the Recording, so I'm going to um, go now. Just a second. Uh, whoops.
Oops. You can't hear that, can you? I'm uh, just sorry. Um, I've got to stop this. <laughs> uh, um, Sorry. Um, let me go back and see if I can set it all up again. Sorry about this. Um, screen share. Share computer set. Holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me, for my being. This is the sixty bone exercise. Become aware of all three bones in each finger and toe, and repeat a line from the holy affirming prayer in the following sequence. Holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being. Holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being, holy affirming, holy denying. Holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Transubstantiate in me for my being, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me. for my being, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me, for my being, Holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being, holy affirming, holy denying. Holy reconciling, transubstantiate in me for my being, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Transubstantiate in me for my being, 
wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling. Transubstantiate in me for my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling. Transubstantiate in me. For my being, wholly affirming, wholly denying, wholly reconciling, transubstantiate in me. For my being. Sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings direct your actions upon us. This is a walking exercise, though it can be done when sitting. Bring your attention to each joint and silently repeat the word. Sources of divine rejoicings, revolts, and sufferings direct your actions upon us sources of divine rejoicings revolts and sufferings direct your actions upon us sources of divine rejoicings revolts and sufferings direct your actions upon us. Holy God, holy firm, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Say the words, sense your bones, and visualize your marrow illuminating. Practice this exercise when walking, sitting, or lying down. Holy God, holy, firm, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy, firm, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy, firm, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Okay. So just, whoops. Sorry about that. It's just uh, started repeating. Now let's just finish by bringing ourselves into the collected state. We all have an atmosphere, emanations, an aura, an energetic field, whatever you want to call it, around ourselves. And collect your atmosphere, collect the energy, draw it back to yourself. Do not allow it to be scattered. Pull it back to yourself. Perhaps a meter, meter and a half. Keep it calm, still, tranquil. And in a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I would like you to just breathe your atmosphere in to your lungs. And as you breathe out, imagine that something remains. Imagine that emanation settle. 
So keep your atmosphere calm, keep it tranquil, keep it still. One, two, three. Breathe it in and as you breathe out, imagine something remains. Imagine that emanations settle within you. Emanations that help you to grow your higher bodies, help you to grow your being. And then silently in your mind, repeat after me, may results of this exercise be transubstantiated within me for my being. And then just return, come back. Now in that passage, let me go back to it. I'll deconstruct it slightly more. Whoops, we got to do it through the share. Um, um, so we are three brained beings. In other words, we are Trinitarian. And I believe this is what is meant by being created in the image of God, or the likeness is actually a better translation than image. Active, passive, reconciled. So, oops. Um, um, Nice. Okay. So when we come here, God the Father, we can actually use the plus sign, God the Son, the equalizing sign, and the Holy Ghost, the negative sign. And if we draw a triangle, positive, negative, reconcile. And if we want to use hydrogens, we can say this is hydrogen one, this is hydrogen three, and this is hydrogen six. The various elements of the Godhead. Let me just erase those and move down. So sources of divine rejoicings, positive, revolts, the negative, and the sufferings. Holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling. Holy God, holy firm, holy immortal. So as I said uh, during the meditation period, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost is descending. But when it's done as the law of three, the higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle, these other three prayers then conform to that proper sequence. And we have a head brain, and our head brain is representative of the holy affirming. It's the positive part of ourself. Our body brain, our body is the negative. And there's a polarity between the positive and negative. And between the positive and negative, when the higher blends with the lower, they meet in the middle. And so these, including God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, as well as these, prayers here all reflect this understanding. They're all Trinitarian. I wouldn't use the word Christian. Uh, Mr. Gurdjieff said that Egypt was Christian thousands of years before the birth of Christ, and by that he meant it followed the same principles. The word Christ, the word Christian is a Greek word. It's a translation of, and I don't know how to say the 
Hebrew word, but Messiah, which means anointed one. So they wouldn't have called themselves Christians in Egypt thousands of years before the birth of Christ. But these would have been the principles, this understanding of the law of three and recognizing this law within ourselves that our head brain, we could also say wholly affirming in our mind. We can then say wholly denying into our body and wholly reconciling into our feeling center or sources of divine rejoicings in the head, revolts in the body, sufferings in the feeling center or holy God in the head, holy firm in the body, holy immortal in the feeling center. Because we are three brained beings. And if the universe is based on Trinitarian principles, if at the highest level we have the holy affirming, the holy reconciling coming down, and the holy denying, we are made in that image. Let me just uh, get rid of these notations. And. Um, Close this for the food diagrams. I've actually got it right here. Um, with holy affirming at the same level as the absolute, holy reconciling at the same level as all worlds, holy denying at the same level of all suns. One, three, six. Just something to think about. Um, so I'm going to, uh, last week I said I was going to sort of unpack a little bit more, uh, about a quote that Mr. Gurdjieff gave to, uh, uh, Uspensky somewhere between 1915 and 1917. So I'm just going to, uh, and I briefly touched on this quote last week. Um, just give me a second. Uh, periods of mass madness often coinciding with geological cataclysms climatic climactic changes and similar phenomenon of a planetary character release a very great quantity of the matter of knowledge. There is nothing unjust in this because those who receive knowledge take nothing that belongs to others, deprive others of nothing. They take only what others have rejected as useless and what in any case would be lost if they did not take it. The collecting of knowledge by some depends on the rejection of knowledge by others. There are periods in the life of humanity which generally coincide with the beginning of the fall of cultures and civilizations, when the masses irretrievably lose their reason and begin to destroy everything that has been created by centuries and millenniums of culture. Such periods of mass madness often coinciding with geological cataclysms, climat climatic changes, and similar phenomenon of a planetary character release a very great quantity of the matter of knowledge. This in its turn necessitates the work of collecting this matter of knowledge, which would otherwise be lost. Thus the work of collecting scattered matter of knowledge frequently coincides with the beginning of the destruction and fall of cultures and civilizations. 
This aspect of the question is clear. The crowd neither wants nor seeks knowledge. And the leaders of the crowd, in their own interests, try to strengthen its fears and dislike of everything new and unknown. The slavery in which mankind lives is based upon this fear. It is even difficult to imagine all of the horror of the slavery. We do not understand what people are losing. But in order to understand the cause of the slavery, it is enough to see how people live, what constitutes the aim of their existence the object of their desires, passions, and aspirations, of what they think, of what they talk, what they serve, and what they worship. Consider what the cultured humanity of our time spends money on, even leaving war out. What commands the highest price? Where the biggest crowds are? If we think for a moment about these questions, it becomes clear that humanity, as it is now, with the interests it lives by, cannot expect to have anything different from what it has. But as I have already said, it cannot be otherwise. Imagine that for the whole of mankind, half a pound of knowledge is allotted a year. If this knowledge is distributed among everyone, each will receive so little that he will remain the fool he was. But thanks to the fact that very few want to have this knowledge, those who take it are able to get, let's, let us say a grain each and acquire the possibility of becoming more intelligent. All cannot become more intelligent even if they wish. And if they did become intelligent, it would not help matters. There exists a general equilibrium which cannot be upset. This is one aspect. The other as I have already said, consists in the fact that no one is concealing anything. There is no mystery whatsoever. But the acquisition or transmission of true knowledge demands great labor and great effort, both of him who receives and of him who gives. And those who possess this knowledge are doing everything they can to transmit and communicate it to the greatest possible number of people, to facilitate people's approach to it and enable them to prepare themselves to receive the truth. But knowledge cannot be given by force to anyone. And as I have already said, an unprejudiced survey of the average man's life, of what fills his day and of the things he is interested in, will at once show whether it is possible to accuse men who possess knowledge of concealing it, of not wishing to give it to people, or not wishing to teach people what they themselves know. He who wants knowledge must himself make the initial efforts to find the source of knowledge and to approach it, taking advantage of the help and indications which are given to all, but which people, as a rule, do not want to see or recognize. Knowledge cannot come to people without effort on their part. They understand this very well in the connection with ordinary knowledge. But in the case of great knowledge, when they admit the possibility of its existence, 
They find it possible to expect something different. Everyone knows very well that if, for instance, a man wants to learn Chinese, it will take several years of intense work. Everyone knows that five years are needed to grasp the principles of medicine and perhaps twice as many years for the study of painting or music. And yet there are theories which affirm that knowledge can come to people without any effort on their part, that they can acquire it even in sleep. The very existence of such theories constitutes an additional explanation of why knowledge cannot come to people. At the same time, it is essential to understand that man's independent efforts to attain anything in this direction can also give no results. A man can only attain knowledge with the help of those who possess it. This must be understood from the beginning. One must learn from him who knows. Now let's go back and deconstruct this. Here he's actually talking about esoteric knowledge, the science of being, the science of human transformation. Here he's talking about the relationship between psychology and cosmology and this higher level of knowledge. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff was most likely born in 1866. He died in 1949. Back then, there were secret societies, there were secret doctrines. And I have a feeling that this was just a marketing ploy by pseudo mystics to pretend that they possessed the knowledge. And here he was saying, this is nonsense. The knowledge is there. It's even more present now in our world with the internet with resources going online these teachings are online true proper teachings are online but there is so much garbage out there that people can get very confused but no one is concealing anything so he's talking about esoteric knowledge and how knowledge as everything in the entire universe is physical. Just flipping back to the alchemy of human transformation. God is hydrogen one, the holy affirming, hydrogen one. The holy reconciling is hydrogen three. These are molecules. These are substances. God may be so refined and the substance of God so refined that we are not able to be aware of it. But he said everything in the universe is material. So uh, this knowledge is there, but it's a higher knowledge. It's a more refined knowledge. It's a more so to speak, and it's a wrong word, but ephemeral knowledge. It's here in the world. It just requires discernment. It requires finding other people who have been walking on the path since before we started walking on the path and learning from them. And, you know, the collecting of knowledge by some depends upon the rejection of knowledge by others. This is also a partial explanation of why there will not and will never be a mass awakening of humanity. Anyone who claims, any spiritual teacher who claims there will be a mass awakening of humanity are not real spiritual teachers. They do not 
understand this. And it wouldn't serve nature's purpose for all of humanity to awaken. It would cause a severe distortion in the earth. And what evolution has spent millions of years doing, slowly working its way up. So the collection of knowledge by some depends upon the rejection of knowledge by others. It's a material quantity. Then he goes on to say there are periods in the life of humanity which generally coincide with the beginning of the fall of cultures and civilizations. When the masses irretrievably lose their reason and begin to destroy everything that has been created by centuries and millenniums of culture. Such periods of mass madness, often coinciding with geological cataclysms, climactic changes, and similar phenomenon of a planetary character, release a very great quantity of the matter of knowledge. This in turn, in its turn, necessitates the work of collecting this matter of knowledge which would otherwise be lost. Thus the work of collecting scattered matter of knowledge frequency frequently coincides with the beginning and the destruction and fall of cultures and civilizations. Here he also said geological cataclysms, climatic changes, phenomenon of a planetary character. If we go back in our minds and think of the world that Mr. Gurdjieff was born into in 1866, my own paternal grandfather was born in 1875. The railroads, telegraph, no airplanes, none of the things that we have now. It was an epical shift caused by the industrial revolution. By the time he was speaking these words to Uspensky, it was during the first world war where millions of people were killing millions of other people. It was the ending of so many different things within the context of Mr. Gurdjieff and Uspensky, the whole Tsarist, Tsar Nicholas, and you know the Russian system was overtaken by the Bolshevik Revolution and the rise of communism. We could see these mass changes taking place. In the 18 or the 19th century, it was the age of monarchs, the age of kings, you know, the Habsburgs and, you know, the British monarchy and the Tsar in Russia. And it all began to crumble. Part of these changes were precipitated by the Industrial Revolution, which in turn precipitated the ability for mass destruction in the First World War. If you had to kill someone with a rock in your hand or a club in your hand, very different than a gun or, you know, a machine gun or bombs or airplanes or whatever. And the Industrial Revolution has brought such cataclysmic changes to this planet. It's led to the climate crisis. It's led to all sorts of problems that we have. And so if we think of the world that Mr. Gurdjieff was born into, and then 
My dad was born in 1922. We think of the world my father was born into. There were biplanes and a few things in the air and automobiles and things were just getting going. But there were not the jet airliners, you know, rocket ships. We had the telegraph. I believe we had radio by then, but uh, moving pictures were starting without sound. Um, that was, in a sense, the beginning of the information technological revolution. Now, the information, you know, the IT revolution, the ability to spread knowledge around through the ether, through radio waves, through television, all of that exponentially increased in 1957 the year I was born. I was actually, I don't talk about this often, I was born on the day that Sputnik 1 was launched into outer space, the first human satellite. And it is the result of satellites and the information technology that is allowing everything to occur online with our cell phones, with everything, and then the rise of computers in the 60s. I remember, I think it was 1984, I bought a, um, a Commodore 1000. It was a little computer with the keyboard that you plugged into your television set, and it held a thousand K, which we thought was immense back then. And then a year later, Apple came out with the iMac. I was one of the first people to purchase an iMac. Um, as a student, it was just incredible. And when I think back to purchasing the iMac in 1985 and now being able to be online with people around the world, talking, seeing their faces, the sharing of data, this process that really began in a sense with the industrial revolution and then with the information technology revolution is accelerating. So right now we are smack in the middle of one of these extraordinary epical changes, geological cataclysms. Well, hopefully the volcanoes won't erupt or a massive comet hit the planet or whatever, but uh, we are certainly going through climatic changes. And these climatic changes are for the most part a result of the industrial revolution, of the burning of carbon or of the release of carbon into the atmosphere because of our use of fossil fuels to drive cars and airplanes and the industrial revolution. So not only are we, you know, experiencing the throes of the industrial revolution, the information technological revolution, that all of these things are leading to these climatic changes and the crisis that we are experiencing on this planet. So he says that, you know, when these things happen, they release a very great quantity of the matter of knowledge. This is esoteric knowledge. This is the knowledge of being, the knowledge of human transformation. This in turn necessitates the work of collecting this matter of knowledge which would otherwise be lost. Thus the work of collecting scattered matter of knowledge frequency frequently coincides with the beginning and the destruction and fall of cultures and civilizations. And here I want to point out one thing. Mr. Gurdjieff was born 1866. Um, I believe one of the documents actually says he was born on December 28, 1865. But this was before the Russian calendar was moved forward two weeks to align with the rest of the world. 
So if it's moved forward two weeks, he would have been born in 1866, approximately January the 13th when he celebrated his birthday. This was just on the precipice, on the cusp of this immense cataclysm, this immense change. And rather than sitting in a room and pretending or claiming he connected with spirits who taught him about all of these things, Mr. Gurdjieff went in search of what he believed was the lost knowledge of an ancient civilization. He started out as a teenage boy, perhaps 14 or 15. He and a friend of his heard rumors of a monastery. They went and found the ruins and they became sort of amateur archeologists and they were searching. And at one point they were sitting at the side of the road eating and his friend got bitten by a poisonous spider and he was afraid of sucking it out. So he cut the flesh out of his friend's leg. Uh, it took them a few days. They reached a village taken in by an Armenian priest. The Armenian priest helped nurse his friend back to health and showed Mr. Gurdjieff, then still a young man, a document that had been in his possession of his family for generations, a map of pre-Sans Egypt. At that point, Mr. Gurdjieff or George, I guess if he was a young man or a young boy, teenager, they changed their plans and they decided to go to Egypt. And in Egypt, he met uh, members of the Seekers of Truth, a professor, a prince, people far older than him who were also engaged in this search of collecting this knowledge. He talks about the Sarmung Brotherhood. Uh, it's been loosely interpreted as the beekeepers. And we can at once see the metaphor. Bees go and take the nectar from the flowers and they take that nectar and they transform it into honey. And so like a bee, Mr. Gurdjieff and members of the Seekers of Truth went throughout the world trying to gain admittance to monasteries, hermitages, ashrams, places of ancient knowledge, collecting it. Mr. Gurdjieff had a very high level of being. He was probably born that way. And he said that he had this ability to be invited into the inner sanctum very quickly. Usually a lot of hermitages, monasteries, whatever, were built metaphorically like concentric circles. There was the outer circle, the esoteric circle. There was the inner circle, the mesoteric circle. And there was the inmost circle, the esoteric circle. And it was in the inmost circle, the esoteric circle, where the true masters taught their most advanced students. Sometimes people would come to the monastery and they would spend their whole lives in the outer circle. Occasionally, some of them would show promise, some kind of light in their eyes or some kind of awareness, and they would be invited into the mesoteric, the middle circle. And then occasionally those in the mesoteric circle would be invited to the esoteric circle. And for some reason, Mr. Gurdjieff was very quickly invited into the inner circle where he was given this knowledge. And in Meetings with Remarkable Men, he talks about how he traveled extensively throughout Central Asia, India, Tibet, North Africa, and even hints at going to Ethiopia, going around and talking to awakened masters, people who had awakened through teachings, through a connection to an esoteric school, through a connection with a valid and proper teaching. And he collected this wisdom. Now, a lot of people think that from the collecting of this wisdom, he developed his system. I tend to disagree with that. And my big point of disagreement is chapter nine, 
of In Search of the Miraculous. And uh, this comes from chapter nine. This is my re-rendition of not all of chapter nine, but a part of chapter nine. And all of his teachings can be fit into these diagrams. If you understand them properly, everything he talks about, everything he does can be explained in relation to this ancient science. So I believe at some point he came across this teaching and then everything else that he and the other seekers of truth found and shared with each other. Some of it, I'm sure they rejected. I'm sure they rejected a lot, but others were like luminous pieces of gold that fit into this ancient science of human transformation. So at this point, when the whole complete old order was changing and a new world was coming into birth, Mr. Gurdjieff was there at the end of the old order. If we think of the world today, there are talks, there's stories. We certainly know that Mr. Gurdjieff went to Tibet. Some say he was there for seven years. Tibet was a real pinnacle of esoteric knowledge, of this knowledge especially at the period when he would have gone there. However, in the late 40s, it was invaded by the communist Chinese, taken over. They caused the Dalai Lama and all sorts of monks and lamas and whatever to flee. Again, this is another representation of what he's saying here. Some people are so angry at the communists for what they did to Tibet. But if Tibet had been and remained an isolated mountain theocratic kingdom, so to speak, we wouldn't have the understanding of Tibetan Buddhism we have today. Just here in Canada, there is a monastery close to Kingston, which is about 150, 200 miles, no, more than 200 miles. No, about 200 miles, about uh, 350 kilometers from here, where there's a monastery and it's run by actual Tibetan lamas. There's another one just north in a place called Barry. I believe there's another one out in British Columbia in the mountains. The communist Chinese by taking over Tibet, caused this knowledge to be spread out into humanity. Otherwise, they would have been very insular and kept it to themselves. So this is an illustration of what is going on. The scattered knowledge getting sent out into the world. There, for those who want to seek it, they can find it. It's more readily available now. This, the knowledge uh, of Tibetan Buddhism is more readily available now than it has been at any time in human history. And by readily available, I mean to the rest of the world. I mean to those who seek knowledge. Now, when we think of the great Sufi hermitages that existed throughout Central Asia, and we look at those places today, run by people with AK-47s, by warlords. They hate the Sufis, the Islamic fundamentalists. And so some of the Sufi masters have actually emigrated to the West. And there are now Sufi groups in major Western cities. The scattering of this knowledge, but the revealing of this knowledge I can go to a Sufi meditation group. I can go to a whole bunch of Sufi meditation groups here in Toronto. A uh, hundred years ago, it was impossible. So this collecting of the scattered matter that 
coincides with the beginning and destruction of the fall of cultures and civilizations. Now here, people don't want this knowledge. You know, this is slavery. Um, and the slavery, as he says, you know, is caused by fear. And, you know, consider what cultured humanity of our time spends money on. Yachts, you know, half a million dollar cars, 11,000 square foot homes, you know, vacation homes, you know, all of that. And it becomes clear the interest that humanity lives by. And here, you know, imagine that the whole knowledge allotted for mankind for every is a pound a year or half a pound. If this esoteric knowledge was distributed among everyone, everyone would receive so little. But if we go back to the earlier thing that he said, was that at the end and the beginning of these ethical periods, this knowledge gets released into the world and we can go and collect it. And the Sarmong Brotherhood, the beekeepers, the collectors of nectar of wisdom, Mr. Gurdjieff, as a collector, as a member of the Seekers of Truth, went out and found all of this information. Um, uh, let me... So this knowledge is not hidden. You can pick up a copy in most bookstores of In Search of the Miraculous. It's still in print. It's been 70 years since the death of P.D. Uspensky. It's out of copyright. It's available online. All of this information is there, but we have to work at it. Now, the other thing is that this knowledge is not head brain knowledge. It's the knowledge of being, and therefore it requires great effort on our part. It requires great labor to absorb this information properly. I remember um, I first read In Search of the Miraculous in 1981. I probably read it maybe 15 times in the next 15 years. There were paragraphs, pages that I probably read 100, 150 times. And in 1995, I moved to England and I sort of put it behind me. And I didn't pick it up again until the summer of 2002. And when I read it again, I was reading the same book, but I was reading a different book because of the work that I had done on myself, the effort I had made to self-remember, to grow my being, the time, the digestion of it. I couldn't believe in 2002 how that book contained so much more information than when I read it in 1981. But it was because of the work I had put into it. It was the work I had put into understanding the knowledge, working through these ideas, even when I wasn't reading the book, trying to figure out personality and essence and identification and all of those things. You can't just read it and expect to understand it. And here he talks about um, how a lot of people think it comes easy. You talk to the neo advaitans the non-dualists, and they say, all you have to do is become aware of the oneness and everything else falls away, just like it's something that can be, we can do like that. And they're leading so many people astray. True knowledge has to be confronted. Mr. Gurdjieff said that one of the weaknesses of our educational system is that we do not teach. We do not educate the subconscious mind. And we do not educate the subconscious mind to engage in something he called confrontational logic, to really confront things in a deep, powerful, and meaningful way. We absorb things like a tape recorder, uh, just recording and then we regurgitate during exams. We don't confront. We 
don't allow this information to seep into our subconscious. We don't make the physical effort necessary to really absorb this knowledge. So we are living, I better stop here. Um, we are living in a very ethical period. We are living in a period when this knowledge has never been easier to find, easier to explore. But part of this knowledge involves the understanding of inner work, the doing of inner work, the real struggle and suffering that we must do consciously will allow us to understand more and more and more of this esoteric knowledge. Now, he also talks about how, you know, the knowledge is limited, say half a pound a year for all of humanity. But we must counter that with the fact that he also says at these periods, such as this period we're going through, this more of this knowledge gets released into the world at this time. So there's a bit of a dialectical tension between there's only a certain amount of knowledge and at these periods in human history, this knowledge is released to the world. So it's got a limited quality, a limited quantity, but there is more availability now, more of an opportunity for us to learn this knowledge, to digest this knowledge. Um, do you have any quick questions, Brian? It's, uh, we're out of time, but... Uh, um, Okay, you've frozen, uh, unfortunately. Um, yeah, you're just sitting there on the screen frozen. Um, uh, maybe I'll bring it back, you know, I'll just talk a little bit about this more on um, the next meeting. Um, at any rate, it is noon. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Brian. Um, thank you for those who are watching on Facebook and thanks for you to those who will be watching on YouTube. Um, try to collect some of this knowledge. Work on it, use it to grow your being so that you can collect more. At any rate, I'd like to thank you again. Take care. Bye now. Thanks, Alan.